the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as a gentle rain from heaven upon the, the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. The poet wrote that. I don't know who. It's anonymous to me. But it aptly expresses what we want to talk about this afternoon. The fruit of liberality. That it blesses the giver and it blesses the receiver, him that takes. And if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. <clears throat> and we're going to read together verses 6 through verse 15. Where Paul writes, But this I say, he that which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, <clears throat> according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. As it is written, He hath dispensed or dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. <coughs> Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ, and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men, and by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Giving blesses the one who gives. And we see this first in relationship to the returns in proportion to the gift. If you look at verse 6 of our text there, when he says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. The idea being presented is that the more you give, the more that you'll receive. The richer the gift, the richer the return. There's an old statement in economics, whether it's true or not might be discussed, but uh, the saying goes that in order to make money, you have to spend money. The idea is you have to spend money, you have to put it out there, in order to make returns. That's the idea that is being expressed here in relationship to giving, though. You have to give if you want to get. And so you're going to receive in relationship to whether or not you give. person who's selfish, who's not going to give anything, well, they better not expect much in return. They're not going to receive it. Sow sparingly, reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, reap bountifully. But also, we see that giving is going to bless the giver in relationship or with a fuller measure of God's love. Look at verse 7. Every man, according as he purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. God loves that one who is willing to give and is cheerful in doing so. And so as he gives and does so cheerfully, God loves that type of attitude. 
that type of a person. And so he receives a fuller measure of God's love. Now, one of the reasons, of course, is because it becomes a reflection of God's character. We could look at God's character, and God is a God who gives. John 3, 16, of course, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And we always talk about the aspect of love is a love that gives. Well, God is love, and God is one who gives. He is a giver. He bestows upon us so many rich blessings within this life, both from a physical sense, but even more so from a spiritual sense. And so as we give, we're reflecting God's character within our life. Because that's the nature of our God. He is a giver. And so he expects us to be a cheerful giver. And uh, in verse 7 there, where we read, according as he purposeth in his heart, there is an attitude of purposing. We make a determination to give. And we do so within our heart, based upon if we read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and verse 2, it's based upon God blessing us. As God blesses us, we give. We see the principle back in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as he goes through those Beatitudes and he gets to record it in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. The one who is merciful, the one who is that cheerful giver, is that one who's going to be getting mercy himself. He's going to be receiving that mercy. But there's also giving in relationship to the fact that God provides us more power or more ability to give. Notice verses 8 through verse 11 of our text. <clears throat> that God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remaineth forever. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower... Both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown. The increase of the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. Here's the giver, and God is able to make, and notice all of these alls in verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. You could say to all good works. Same thing. God's able to make that abound to that one who is that cheerful giver of the previous verse. When we are that cheerful giver, God is going to bless us. And he again, notice uh, in the, middle, the latter part of verse 10, he's going to multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And so it comes back to us in relationship to we have more and power, more ability to give when we're giving. Verse 11 again, being enriched. We are enriched by God to that bountifulness, all bountifulness. And so we are given more so that we can give. In Proverbs 11th chapter, verse 24 and verse 25, he says, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more that is meat, but it tendereth to poverty. The liberal so shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. 
he scatters, yet he increases. It seems counterproductive. Scatter more, receive more. The one that withholds, though, doesn't have that to scatter. Tends to poverty. The liberal soul, on the other hand, made fat. In other words, he's getting more and more. Why? Because God is blessing that individual who is the giver. He doesn't bless the one that refuses to give. Behind that generous giver, there's a great reserve. There's a song that's in our songbook. I said, Paul, a good song lead would be, There is a Sea. He said, I've sung it once. I don't think uh, I know it. <laughs> Wasn't go about to. But it goes, there is a sea. And he's talking about the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. There's a sea which day by day receives the rippling rills and streams from spring that wells of God, from wells of God or fall from the cedar hills. But what it thus receives, it gives with glad, unsparing hand. A stream more wide, with deeper tide, flows on to lower land. That's the Sea of Galilee that's being described there. Receives all of this water, but then it flows out. But the second verse is, there is a sea which day by day receives the fuller tide, but all its store it, it keeps nor gives to shore nor sea beside. Its Jordan stream, now turned to brine, lies heavy as molten lead. Its dreadful name doth e'er proclaim that sea is waste and dead. It is referred to as the Dead Sea. It gets plenty of water from the Jordan River, but it doesn't flow anywhere else. It stays right there and it turns to salt, a salt sea. And so the third verse asks the question, what, which shall it be for you and me? Who God's good gifts obtain, shall we accept for self alone or take to give again? For he who once was rich indeed laid all his glory down that by his grace our ransomed race should, should share his wealth and crown. We receive in order to give. There's that principle that in order to receive, we give. When we give, God will give more and more to us. There's an old epitaph that read, Here's, here lies a man. Men thought him mad. The more he gave, the more he had. And that reminded me of uh, that epitaph of Brother A.M. Burton. Some of you might remember him. Uh, he was a member of the Lord's Church. A great giver. Became a millionaire. I believe it was some type of insurance that he was in. And he gave more and more to the point where he was giving over 95% of his income. And he made the statement one time that he could not outgive God because he kept receiving more and more and more. He blessed others, yes, by his giving, but he was blessed by God as a result. That's what Paul is saying here. That God will bless us with more power to give, more abilities to give, but only if we're givers ourselves. If we're just those who take and never give, then that reserve, that which God has and can given to us, will not be given. It's only when we give. And then 
God will bless us, the giver, with a fuller life. It makes room for something better. The problem really with one who refuses to give is not that he's refusing to give. It's a problem of covetousness on his part. There's a stinginess there that I want it all, it's just mine, I have mine, you get yours, I don't care about you. And it's a selfish covetousness that becomes stingy. And by giving and giving cheerfully, it eliminates those things for that which is better. We don't become bitter old people when we continue to give. And yet, stinginess will make us exactly that. We get bitter and become worse and worse. It enlarges our affections, our love. It, uh, it makes us more like God, our maker. As we mentioned earlier, God is one who is a giver. He does give. And so as we give, it's providing us a fuller, a greater life than what we had otherwise. And it also fits us for heaven itself. If God is a God who gives, but I refuse to give, how in the world can I expect to spend an eternity with Him? I'm going to have to be a giver if... I expect to be like unto God because God is a giver. We are to be a partaker, Peter says in St. Peter 1, of the divine nature, God's nature. We are to take upon ourselves His attributes, His characteristics. God is a giver. He gives unto us. And so when we take that upon ourselves, It fits us for living with Him. But when we refuse to give, it turns the opposite away from God. We're no longer likened to Him. We're no longer taking of His divine nature. We're we're going away from Him instead of toward Him. Instead of fitting us for heaven, it fits us from a separation from God and the devil's hell. And so giving blesses the giver, that one who is willing to give, and give cheerfully and give liberally. But also giving blesses the one who takes. With a lot of individuals, it is easier for them to be a giver than a taker they have to learn to take as well. Uh, I know a lot of young preachers starting out as they start preaching something, will wedding, a funeral, and somebody will offer them money. No, no, I don't. Do. And you've cheated the person out of giving. You have to learn to be a good receiver even as you are a good giver. God's liberality blessed us. Remember what James wrote in James 1, 17, that every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Are we going to reject the gifts of God, those that are good and perfect, Do we not want to receive those gifts? It's through the gift of of Jesus and His death upon the cross that God, the Godhead, blesses us. God the Father gave His Son to die upon the cross for us. There's a liberality that blesses us. I would not be saved without that wonderful gift that God provided for me. 
and for you. No one would be able to be saved. Christ left heaven's home, that eternal equality with the Father. He gave that up, emptied himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, Philippians 2 and verse 6 and 7. What a wonderful gift that is for us that he was willing to leave heaven's home in that eternal equality with God, and he comes to this world for the express purpose of dying upon the cross. That horrible, the most evil devised death that's been devised by man. And he's willingly leaving heaven to come and embrace that. And he says, I give myself that no one can take my life from me, but he willingly gave it. And then we start learning a little bit more of, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave. And he gave for the world. Look at it in our text in verse 9. When he mentioned, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he were rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Here Christ was, he was rich. Here's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Christ was rich. What was it? He was on an eternal equality with the Father. Did not think that was something to be held on to at all cost, which would be in the eternal death spiritually of all men because all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so what did he do? Though he were rich, he became poor. He left heaven's home to come to this earth to die upon that cross. So through his poverty, his leaving heaven, he becoming and humbling himself and becoming man, being found in the fashion of man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There's that poverty that he willingly went through. That through that poverty, we might be rich that I can have my sins washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, that I can receive all spiritual blessings in Christ in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and verse 3, that I can have now no condemnation in Christ, Romans 8 and verse 1, that I can become that new child, that new creation, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, in Christ Jesus. I can become rich. I can be the child of God. I can have all of my sins, all of the errors, all of the things that I've done in my past washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he, even though he was rich, he gave himself and became poor so that I could become that. It blesses me. And it, it blesses you. And so notice what our giving does for others. First, it provides temporal relief. Notice verse 12. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by, <coughs> by many thanksgiving unto God. Here is the administration of this service. What's he talking about? Here is this gift that is being given to the poor saints, to others that were in great poverty. They have their needs, temporal needs, met. They were in great poverty. There was a a famine that was in that area. And so they gave so that those needs could be met. 
And so their gift, our gifts, will fill empty stomachs. It will hush the cries of the distressed, heal the wounds of the afflicted. It blesses, it provides those temporary reliefs from the problems and from the heartaches that they are in at that time. It also awakens in the heart of that one who receives the grace of gratitude. Notice in our text, verse 11 and verse 12 first, that being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. It caused those who received the gift to thank God as a result of their needs being met. And then he uses the illustration to, <coughs> to end this in verse 15. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. And so from that spiritual standpoint in which God sends, gave his son to die, the son willingly leaving heaven's home to die for us. It expresses, it brings up, it wells within our body a thankfulness to God for that wonderful gift. A gift that you know, we can't even imagine the depths and the riches of that gift that God gave. Yet not only this a gift will revive the body, fill those hunger, hungry stomachs, for example, but it also revives the spirit as well. A lot of times people become so embattled that they just lose that aspect of thankfulness for what they have. And we are to be a thankful people. All through the Bible, it encourages us as humans to be thankful. In the 116th Psalm, for example, in verse 12, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Well, a heart of thankfulness for one thing. And so Colossians 3 and verse 15 tells us to let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. We are to be a thankful people. Many times and in our society today, that thankfulness is a lost art. We are to remember that which someone does that is for our good, and we are to be thankful for them, thankful for what they've done. And then last, it unites them, the receiver, with the giver. Notice verse 13 and 14 again. <clears throat> Whiles by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and to all men. And by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Now here is those individuals. And at this time we mention the Jewish brethren were doubting the conversion of the Gentiles, the Gentile world. Whether, uh, if you will recall in Acts 11th chapter, after Peter's conversion of Cornelius and his household, they come back to Jerusalem and, why did you go to Jer Gentiles? They didn't, prior to that time, believe that the Gentiles, that the gospel applied to them. And so there was still that carryover. They s doubted the spirituality of these Corinthian brethren even. But now then, the Corinthian brethren give this gift, along with other places in the Gentile world, 
and this gift, this money is now given to these Jewish brethren, it ties them together. They're thanking those brethren for their gift, for their liberality. And they're praying for those brethren. There was a confidence now between the Jews and the Gentiles that brought them together instead of continuing to drive them apart. The love that was demonstrated by the Corinthians and by those who gave to those who received grew greater and it replaced that suspicion, that hatred that the Jew and Gentile at one time possessed one toward another. And when I say hatred, yes, there was a great deal of hatred between Jew and Gentile. We think we have racial problems today. It's nothing nearly as bad as what you saw then. There was a hatred between Jew and Gentile. Well, now then, love was taking the place of that hatred. Why? Because of the gift which they gave. And so thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift, though. The gift of God's Son. The the Father sent his Son to this world to die upon the cross, to purchase the church of Christ, to build that church, to be the head of the church. Thanks be to God for that unspeakable gift. And the fact that God, even before the creation of the world, had devised this plan to save you and me, sinful mankind, through that unspeakable gift of His Son. Now, what's our response to it? It should be a thankful living that I'm going to live for Him. And the gift of the Son to leave that heaven's home, to come and suffer that death so that you and I can be saved, so that we can have our sins washed away by the blood that he shed upon Calvary's tree. Through our obedience to what he says and in our faith, repenting of our sins, making a confession that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and then being immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins, we come in contact with that blood in that watery grave of baptism, that blood that Christ shed upon Calvary's tree, that blood that washes away our sins, makes us pure, makes us clean, and unites us truly with God. And now then we can have fellowship with Him with all those who live faithful to Him. And as long as we continue in faithfulness to God, we'll have that fellowship with Him. But if we turn away from that, then God's provided another way in which He offers unto us to repent of our sins and pray to Him for the forgiveness of them. And through that, we can once again restore that fellowship with God and all of the blessings which He blesses His children. If you need to come this afternoon, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.